today comes from Romans 8, um, verses 22 through to 28. Um, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what's, what is in, in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. I don't have your voice then, so. very much Deirdre. I think we have a perfect illustration of uh, what Ben was mentioning at the beginning of the service. God bless you Deirdre. Thank you. Uh, please allow me to pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this morning, before your throne of grace, and to receive uh, your word. Lord, we receive it with uh, eagerness this morning, and we thank you for that, because we know that uh, the eagerness is not uh, coming from us. It is also your grace that we found joy in your word. Lord, I pray for myself as I stand here before your people to share with them the bread of life, the truth, your word. Lord, I pray for myself Help me, help me to, to share it as I ought to share it with trembling lips. And I pray for my brothers, my sisters, that they also receive it as the word of the living God, not the word of Pastor Max, of a man, but the word of the one who holds everything in his hands including every breath that you take. I ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Well, we uh, resume our study of uh, the book of uh, Romans after two Sundays uh, spent on uh, the uh, Palm Sundays and also the uh, Resurrection Day. We'll go back to our study of the book of Romans. Now, remember we were studying the uh, book of uh, Romans. Uh, we arrived at uh, chapter 8. And uh, chapter 8, if you remember, it starts with uh, this wonderful verse that says, uh, there is now no more condemnation in, for those who are in Christ. And so in the, the entire chapter 8 is 
actually about this very first statement, the assurance, the certainty of our salvation. And so the Apostle Paul will spend the following verses to provide us with several grounds, proofs, on which we can stand to have the assurance of our salvation, on which we can say, yes, I know for sure that I belong to Jesus, that I belong to these people who have been called Christians. I know I'm a true Christian. I'm not a fake Christian. And this is important because there are moments in our life, especially when we are in our lows, when we sing, because all of us unfortunately sing, the devil can come and tell us, you see, you are not a Christian. And those things can be source of uh, troubles, even depression, I would call spiritual depression. So we have here a list of uh, evidence that the Apostle Paul gave us, and we already covered some of them. We saw, for instance, that uh, when we are Christian, we have the Spirit of God in us, Romans 8, the verse 9. Those who are in Christ, they have the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit does the work in us. He is mortifying, helping us to mortify the evil deeds of the flesh. We saw that if we are in Christ, if we have the Holy Spirit, one of the evidences is that when we see the deeds, the evil deeds of flesh in us, we take action. We don't collaborate, cooperate with those deeds. We are disturbed by them and we take actions. We confess, we repent, we do all kinds of things to get rid of them. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's one evidence. We saw also the other evidence is the adoption, the spirit of adoption, adoption or sonship. We saw that uh, the Christian is not someone who is just merely forgiven. Christianity is more than forgiveness of your sins. Of course, forgiveness of the sin is a very important thing. It's a starting point. It's the entry. Yet, Christianity is much more than this. It's about sonship. It's about adoption. It's about a relationship with the Father, not with a judge. We also saw that this is one ground of the certainty of our salvation. That indeed we have this relationship of this nature of father and son with God. We also saw another ground, and this is the strongest ground of the assurance of our salvation, which is that the Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are sons of God. And this is extremely powerful. You know, I mentioned to you couple of times that uh, we have many ways to prove Christianity is the only truth. You can do historical scientific research and you found that indeed the Bible is the most authentic, most documented book and therefore what is written there is true historically and that can help you to have faith in what is written here. We saw testimonies of people, we saw a number of things that can help you to believe that this is the truth but the greatest, the strongest evidence is what the Holy Spirit testifies to my spirit, to your spirit, internally in your heart. You were not there at the day of your birth. I mean, you were there, of course, but you were not aware. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's not very logical. You were there, but you were not aware of it. Yet, many of us, many children, they have the strong the strongest conviction, this is my dad, this is my mother. How? Based on the relationship they have, they believe that this is my mother, my father. The Holy Spirit in us testify that we are sons of God. And then the Apostle Paul came to another ground of the assurance of our salvation, which is our union with Christ. He says that if we are in Christ, if we suffer, it is normal. A true Christian suffers for Christ. We are not talking about any kind of suffering. We are talking about the suffering of the Christian. If we are united in Christ, and Christ has been raised, he will go into his glory. He has been in his glory, and we will also join him in his glory. How can we be in him only for his glory and not for his suffering? Christians... The history of the Bible, the of Christians, says that Christians have been persecuted. 
because of Christ. And he said it so many times. The Lord himself, he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of me, for great is the reward in heaven. Because before them, the prophets were also persecuted in the same way. So it's a pattern. That's a ground of the assurance of our salvation. I am persecuted, and we saw different forms of persecution. It can be even just our family, our friends, people who reject us because of our faith. That's a persecution. That's a ground of the salvation, of the assurance of the salvation. But talking about this uh, persecution, he said that those who are persecuted, they are eagerly waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. That's a new ground of the assurance of our salvation. The true Christian is someone who is looking forward to something. The one we saved is not looking into the now. He is looking into the new age to come. And there is this groaning, this eager expectation, that's what we saw last time, that this is another ground, another evidence. If I have that longing for the things to come, we don't know any fiancé who is not waiting for the day of the waiting. And if you are waiting for that day eagerly, with eager expectation, that's another ground of the certainty of our salvation. But the Apostle Paul, now we come to this verse, I was just recapping what we saw before, and now it comes to this verse here, 24, because last time we stopped at 23. Talking about the same topic, he continued now in verse 24, and then he said, for in this hope, so you see of course the link here, the word for, so he is talking about the same thing that he mentioned in the previous verses. He's still talking about this groaning, this longing, this eager expectation. For in this hope we were saved. So he's calling this longing expectation, this groaning, he's calling it hope. For in this hope we were saved. Now we see here that... Uh, the Christian is someone who has this holy dissatisfaction in his body. He wants a new body because this flesh is sinning and there is a conflict, a turmoil in him. He's waiting for the resurrection of the dead, having this new body. And in that longing, we say he is hoping. It is a hope. We call it a hope. And this morning, we are going to spend time on this hope because it's an ex extremely important component of the Christian life. We are characterized by the hope, the hope of glory. The Christian hope is a key element of our life. And it's another, I mean, it's the same groaning, but it's a further confirmation, ground of the, the certainty of our salvation. Do you have that hope? Do I have that hope? That's the question. The Apostle Paul wants us to answer in these coming verses. So we will spend the time to talk about hope this morning. And the first part of the sermon, we will talk about the joy that hope brings in the Christian life. Without hope, there is no joy in the Christian life. Our Christian experience will be dull, will be sad at moments and often. That will be the first part. We will see that there is also a false hope. And that false hope, some of us, we have it sometimes, or even most of the times. And that false hope is the source of some of our greatest problems in our Christian life. And then in the last part of the sermon, we will see that uh, how can we remain, how can we sustain that hope, that Christian hope? We see that it's only by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now let's start with the first part. The true Christian hope is a vital ground for a joyful Christian life. The Apostle Paul starting to surpass this section. He says here, for in this hope you were saved. So in other words, the moment we are saved, the moment our justification has been triggered, has occurred, there is this process, this hope that starts at the same time. He says you were saved we were saved in hope. But the truth is, he's writing to the Romans. And the Romans, we know from history that they were people, they're also from the Bible, that they were Christians who suffered a great deal. They were persecuted. 
they were killed because of Christ. But what kind of hope these people can have in the midst of this suffering? One of the classical problems that we face and that people challenge us about, they say, your Christianity, if there is this God, this good God, why there is so much suffering on earth? Why you Christian, you suffer so much? Can we have hope and suffering at the same time? What does this hope bring into our life when we are in the midst of suffering? When we lose someone, when we lose our children, when we have the bad news that we have a cancer, or when, like yesterday, Pastor George was buried in Nonka. What is that hope? What does it do in that moment? Well, brothers and sisters, I have a good news. If you are a Christian, this world, this evil world where we live in, with a lot of sufferings, it is the perfect ground to test the truthfulness of what the Bible says. Only there, in this world, we can really test if what the Bible says is true or not. And you can test it with your personal life. Now let's see how we can test this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, the Apostle Paul wrote, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, that ceasing. give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we see clearly that even if we are suffering, the apostle will say, no, because of this hope, we can rejoice. Now let's see how we can rejoice even in the midst of these sufferings. Now in order to understand what is hope, because here we need to understand what is this, the nature of this hope, the Christian hope, not any kind of hope. We are talking about a very peculiar type of hope, the Christian hope. We need to go back to the verse. It says, for in this hope, we were saved. Now, this is a strange statement because we know that uh, we are saved by faith, not by hope. So why is he mentioning here, we were saved in hope? What does it mean, that statement? And it's a very important statement to understand. We were saved in hope. We were supposed to be saved by faith. So what does it mean here? Now, to understand this, we need to understand one very important doctrine, which is the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation says that basically we are saved in the past, in the present, and in the future. Salvation has three aspects. The past, the present, and the future. The Apostle Paul here used the past tense. He said, we were saved in hope. Now what is salvation in the past? Now, salvation in the past simply refers to our justification. So the moment we receive Christ, we repent and accept it as our Lord and Savior. We are justified. This happens once for all. It is in the past. We are not still being justified. No, we are justified once. And therefore, even when you sin, you cannot go back and say, Oh, maybe I'm losing my salvation. No, you are justified. This happens in the past. But it happens that... Uh, we have been freed. We are now free from the law. That's what we read in Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law, to the body of Christ. So there is no more condemnation. It is in the past. That's a fact. That's an aspect of salvation. We will no longer suffer the wrath of God. Never. That's done. But it happens that not only... The penalty of sin, the condemnation, is an issue that has been already addressed. But we see on a daily basis that uh, there is another aspect of sin that is still in our flesh, in our body, which is simply the presence of sin. There is condemnation, but the presence of sin is still there. We are struggling in our own flesh with sin. So we can see that we are being saved from sin. And that's the process of sanctification. That's salvation in the present. The work of the Holy Spirit, is we are being saved in the present. But then we see there is a future aspect of salvation as well, which is our glorification to come. We know that uh, the salvation is not yet complete. If it was complete, there should not be seen anymore. The presence of sin, the power of sin should be gone. But sin is still powerful. It's still present. So we are waiting 
for a last, the last part of the process of salvation. Now this is very important to understand and this will help you to understand what is hope. Now we are saved by faith that justification. Justified by faith and faith alone. And faith basically it is looking always back to the finished work of Christ. Faith looks back in the past to the finished work of Christ. Faith is the ground, is what tells you, yes, Christ died for me and this is done. That's faith. Without faith, you cannot believe in that. But hope is looking forward to the thing that Christ purchased on the cross. He died, he purchased something. That's something that has been purchased. We are certain that it has happened. That's faith that helps us to be certain. But hope is now the waiting of the things to happen. Faith is the knowing of the things, but hope is the waiting, the longing of what has been purchased for us. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So hope is the longing for the things to happen. Those things are not yet seen. They are not yet there. We are hoping to see them. And a Christian is someone who has the hope that those things for sure will happen. And he is waiting for them. Are you waiting for something? Romans chapter 8 verse 24, 25. He says here, for this hope, for in this hope you were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is, he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So you see here, clearly, we are supposed to wait for something. Now, there is unfortunately a misunderstanding often about the Christian hope. Instinctively, we tend to think of hope as something we fall back on when our faith gets weaker. So for instance, you face a disease, a calamity, and you wonder, is God really with me? Your faith gets weak. And now you pray and you say, hopefully God can do something for me. Hopefully God can take me out of this. But that's not the Christian hope. That is being hopeful. You hope maybe something good can happen. That's very weak. That's not, that's not the hope the Bible is talking about. The hope the Bible is talking about is of a completely different nature. The people of this world, they are hopeful for something good to happen now. In this world, hope is waiting for something to be revealed, not here, in the life to come. Hope is waiting for the revelation, the manifestation of the ultimate salvation. Hope doesn't believe that a sin can be addressed by laws voted at the parliament. Christians cannot be hopeful, let do something that maybe they will vote a law against a gay marriage and things like that. That's being hopeful. That's not the Christian hope. The Christian hope is a waiting for the world that will come where there will be no more homosexuality, no more sin, no more corruption. And this waiting, we wait patiently, is a joyful waiting. It's not something that we Christians, we are waiting and we are sad and we wonder, uh, oh, what is happening to me next? No, no, no. Hope is extremely joyful. It's an eager expectation. Uh, you may know that I haven't seen my mother for six years. And uh, she came now to visit us after six years. And uh, she arrived and uh, one of the things she did this week is that she cooked one of my most favorite African meals. We call it gassa. This is basically goat made with uh, a special tomato gravy. I mean, it's just amazing. I haven't had it for years. And she made it this week. And she made a good, good amount of it. So we had it the first time. We enjoyed it. And then we put it in the fridge for the coming days. The following days, 
I didn't want to eat anything. I could fast without any problem because I was waiting for the moment we are going to have the next dinner and to eat again in Gaza. You see, in that uh, simple example, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to have my ngasa again because it is in the fridge. I cannot see it when I'm at work, but I know for sure that I will have it when I will come back home. So I can skip lunch. And indeed, I skipped breakfast. I skipped breakfast that day. Why? Because I know for sure it is in the fridge and I have had a foretaste of it. I know how good it is. You know, brothers and sisters, Christians are people who have a first installment of the glory to come. They have a first test of what is to come. And because they had that first test, they are ready and they are waiting joyfully with patience. Something they cannot see now, but they know for sure it is coming. This is the Christian hope, brothers and sisters. This is what the Apostle Paul meant when he said in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he said that... Uh, the sufferings of this present age cannot be compared with the glory to come. He was certain these sufferings is nothing compared to the glory to come. The meal at my work's place is nothing compared to the Gaza to come. But we are talking about the meal, something perishable. What about something eternal, which is the glory to come? So we see in that first part, brothers and sisters, the Christian hope. It brings a joy in our life because we are waiting for something we are certain about. And whatever happens to us, we can receive a bad news. It doesn't affect that hope. I can be deprived of food. It doesn't affect my hope. I know I will have my meal. But unfortunately, there is a false hope as well. There's a false hope uh, that sometimes we Christians we may have. And we may think that this is the Christian hope. Some of us, uh, when we go through difficulties, uh, we pray sometimes in those terms, uh, Lord, look how weak I am. I tend to fall into that same sin again and again and again. Oh Lord, please, I plead to you, please save me. I doubt even whether I'm saved because I keep doing that thing. So I'm hoping to be saved. Brothers and sisters, this is a very stressful Christian experience. And I have known Christians, pastors, who told me that. You commit a sin, you can lose your salvation. And then you hope you may be saved next time. This is very stressful. This is not different than the Muslim faith. Based on what you do. That's not the Christian hope. The Christian hope is beyond faith. It's the next stage. I have certainty that I am saved in Christ. Now I'm hoping, waiting for my inheritance. That's what it is. I'm not doubting whether I will have my inheritance. I know I have an inheritance. So this is a fake hope. But this is having actually a too little hope. But there is a greater danger, which is to have a too strong hope. That is not the Christian hope at all. Now, what is that strong hope? Now, sometimes we, we hear some Christians, and these are brothers and sisters. I'm not saying that they are not Christians. But it's a matter of doctrine, having a sound doctrine. So sometimes we hear some Christians, they believe that salvation has been completed. They use many verses, like for instance, uh, when Christ says on the cross that it is finished. Or they even use uh, the same passage that we are talking about here. We were saved in hope. So they say it is done. It is in the past. It is finished. Therefore, they claim that we Christians should not be sick, for instance. Because Christ, based on Isaiah 53, he says that uh, he already took all our infirmities. So we should not be sick anymore. They have too strong hope. Brothers and sisters, if that is the case, why Paul is saying hope is for something you do not see? I mean, if you say that from now on 
no more sickness. So you will see it, but it's something that you don't see yet. If there is sickness, the perfect health is not yet seen. We are hoping for the new body that will never decay, that will never get sick. But this body, of course, will get sick. This week, uh, we got uh, a call from France that my sister, my older sister, who is uh, two years older than me, she's a strong Christian. We got a call that she had a stroke. And she's still in hospital right now. This happened just a couple of days ago. She never had a stroke. She cannot move. She cannot speak at this moment. And we are praying for God to have mercy and to heal her. Now, when this uh, very bad news uh, came to us, in the family, we have people at different stage in their faith. Some people say that we claim healing immediately. They have a too strong hope. They claim, they say this cannot happen. She's a servant of God. Some people were crying, saying, what have we done? to have this in our family. Many were devastated. You see, in this moment, the Psalms 112, verse 6 to 8 says, For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, Trusting in the Lord. When we got this bad news, this verse says, the righteous is not afraid of bad news. We got the bad news. And there were fear and terror. Terrified. People were terrified. You see, brothers and sisters, the Christian hope is not having this too strong hope that saying we claim, we said, because the, as a matter of fact, yesterday I was in Nongkai. We buried Pastor George. He died from a cancer. Many claimed that he would be healed. He has not been healed. Not in the way they want. That's too much hope. That's not the Christian hope. The Christian hope is my sister, Pastor George, if it is the will of God that the time has come, they will not have stroke. They will not have cancer anymore. And I'm sure of that. Why? Because Pastor Josh right now is healed of cancer. There is no more cancer where he is. There will be no more stroke where my sister will be if God calls her back. And I have that hope. I don't have to cry. I can cry, of course, because I will miss her if that is the case. I cried yesterday because I miss Pastor Josh. He is a terrific man of God. But... I rejoice because the true hope is that for us Christian funerals is a moment of joy. It's the moment that salvation, ultimate salvation has been achieved. So you see, brothers and sisters, the Christian hope is not a too little, it's not a too strong hope. It is simply a quiet, confident trust in the providence and the plan of God. And when we have that trust and confidence, whatever happens to you tomorrow, you may have calamities, you may have bad things happen to you, you will wait patiently with patience because you know what is to come. That takes me to the last part of this sermon. It is easy for me to share that with you here. It is easy to say when calamities come, troubles come, don't worry. There is this hope you will be joyful. But as a matter of fact, that's not what happens to most of us. When those things happen, the reality is, even me, as I'm talking to you, 
I will often get sad. As you know, I got a cancer. I was sad at the first time. So how can we remain in that true hope? How can we maintain it? Where does it come from? Because it is something that is not from man. It's not human. It's something that comes from God. But how can you have it? That leads me to the last part of the story. How to remain in that hope. Now, we read in verse um, 26 of this passage. The Apostle Paul, after talking about the Christian hope, he continues and he says, verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit help us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings to deep for words. The last part of this sermon, I say, the Holy Spirit, the title of this last part is, the Holy Spirit alone can maintain us in this true hope. Now, how does it do it? The Apostle Paul tells us how he does it. He says, and I read again, in our weakness, so he recognized that we are weak. There is infirmity in us. We will see what he's talking about. And he says that because of that, the Holy Spirit is the one interceding for us with groaning. So what is that groaning again? Because we saw that the nature was groaning. We saw that we ourselves, we are groaning. And now we hear that there is another type of groaning from the Holy Spirit. When we face those difficulties, brothers and sisters, the first thing that we do is to pray. In the case of my sister or in the case of Pastor George, the first thing that happened is that we all started to pray. And what happens is that uh, many people were praying, as I explained to you, for total healing. This is the majority of Christians, that's their reaction. Healing. And they pray for the healing of Pastor Joseph, as I mentioned earlier. But Paul is saying here that uh, this way, this hope, and this way of praying in that hope, he's saying that uh, you, you and I, we have to be careful because we do not know how to pray. Now, he's not saying that we don't know how to pray. He's saying we don't know what to pray for. That's what he's saying. We all know how to pray. We all know that, okay, you now when we pray, you know, we come in the name of Jesus because only by him we can go to the Father. We know he teaches us how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, the Lord's Prayer. So we know how to pray. But the question here is what to pray for in some moments. There are moments of life we don't know what to pray for. You have this situation, you say, Pastor George is, is sick, I must pray for his healing. My sister has a stroke, I must pray for healing. He said, no, are you sure this is what you must pray for? He's not asking, telling us how to pray. We know how to pray from the Lord's Prayer. He's telling us, do you know in those moments what to pray for? There are moments, of course, most of the time you know what to pray for, because it is written in the Bible. We can pray for the salvation of our children. I mean, that's, that's very obvious. We can pray for people to receive Christ. That's obvious. But here he's talking about in those moments when we go through sufferings, we do not know what to pray for. And therefore, we need a help, the Holy Spirit. Now, how does it work? The first thing that the, the Apostle Paul tells us here is that, uh, likewise, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. So he's saying that, uh, wait a second, there is a weakness in you and I. And that's why you cannot pray. And actually, he's simply referring to the fall of man. You know the moment in Genesis chapter 3 when there was the fall of man, when sin came into humanity, the flesh was corrupt. The flesh became like a disabled. An infirmity was in the flesh. And that infirmity is a limitation. And one of the very sad part about that limitation is that we do not know anymore. We don't understand anymore. We have difficulty to understand the things of God. We do not really, because of that, of that infirmity, we struggle to discern the will of God. And in those moments, we don't know what is the will of God. And therefore, we may pray for the wrong thing. And of course, it's a very dangerous thing, because when you pray for the wrong thing, you pray for healing, for instance, and it doesn't happen, you can be devastating. Your faith can even be completely broken. And we saw that it happens to several people I know personally. So we need to know what to pray for. Now, the Holy Spirit is the agent helping us. He's the person helping us how to pray, what to pray for, excuse me. Now, this is something very serious, brothers and sisters, because it happened 
to great men of God, they didn't know what to pray for. So please, don't be arrogant spiritually. Don't think that you know what to pray for. Because great men of God struggle how to pray. You may remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 7 onwards, the Apostle Paul, he mentioned that uh, the Satan, a messenger of Satan put a thorn in his flesh, and three times he pleaded to God to remove the thorn from his flesh. So he didn't bother to ask, you know, for him it was very logical to pray that the thorn be removed. Because it is very logical, it's rational. If this thorn is removed, he will be in a better health, better situation, so that he can continue this great ministry that he was doing. So it makes perfect sense to pray for his healing. But do you know what God answered? God said, my grace is sufficient. For it is in weakness that my power is made perfect. God rebuked Paul. He was not healed. Can you realize the apostle Paul didn't know what to pray for? In his weakness, God has a different plan. Pastor George is deaf yesterday at the funerals. There was a great time of a great sermon. I, I shared there over there. Not that I did a great sermon. There was other people preaching. I, they gave me some time to share. We don't know some people, and I believe some people heard the gospel. And yesterday, some people came to Christ. But not only the Apostle Paul had that difficulty not knowing what to pray for. Can you imagine Moses? The great Moses? If you read Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23 to 29, Moses arrived and said, Oh God, you have been so great. Look at all the things you have done. Now God, now we like to go and cross the Jordan and go into the promised land. Do you know what God told Moses? He said, enough. This is the last time you bring this petition before me. You will not go to the promised land. Moses will not go to the promised land. Moses didn't know what to pray for. He was praying for the wrong thing. And now the Apostle Paul is telling us here that this is a serious issue. Even the Lord Jesus, during his days on earth, do you remember that he had this time of perplexity? In John chapter 12, verse 27, he said, Now is my soul trouble, and what shall I pray? Well, sorry, what shall I say? Can you imagine the Lord Jesus? You are talking about the Lord Jesus, Son of Man. Now is my soul trouble, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. The Apostle Paul, again, he learned his lessons. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, he said, I desire to depart, to go, to be with Jesus. But because of you, I understand that I have to stay. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit, when we are facing those situations, we should better go. Like the Apostle Paul said, I don't know what to pray for. I want to go. I don't want to stay on this earth, but maybe you want me to stay here. So Holy Spirit, God, help me, show me. And God, show him. And that's how we should come in those moments of affliction. What should I pray for? Maybe the will of God is that this very affliction will continue. Don't just pray for it to be removed. Pray for the will of God. In Jeremiah chapter 17, we read a very important passage and many of you know it. We read verse 9 to 10. Their heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. The Holy Spirit, as you come to pray, through these wordless groans, groanings, is searching your heart. And that's why we read. The one who knows the mind of God is searching your heart. Because brothers and sisters, you and I, we don't know. You and I, we have no access to our heart. No man has access to the heart of man except God. There are terrible things in our heart. Matthew chapter 12 verse 34 says that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sometimes things come out of our mind and we are horrified. Because in our heart, there are all kinds of things. The heart is deceitful. And in those moments, the Holy Spirit is the one who, through those groanings, is going and searching and bringing out those things. And as it comes out, we realize our condition. And then we become humble before God. Those are the groanings. And then we wait for God. 
to do something about it. Something about that situation. And as he's doing this, he will regain hope and will regain trust. And that's the only way, brothers and sisters, to remain, to have the hope, the true Christian hope, is through this moment of prayer by the Holy Spirit. That's why, brothers and sisters, sometimes you may wonder, why do we need to pray? Yes, you need to pray because when you go there, things will be revealed about your heart through those groanings. And as those things are coming out, you will find joy and you will find peace about what is happening. Sometimes it is even because of things in your heart that you are going through those situations and God wants to show them to you so that it can be addressed and you will fall into groaning. And these groanings, they will be turned, they will turn your sadness into joy. The woman who is delivering a baby is groaning because it's painful. But she has this assurance that something great is coming, this baby is coming alive. And that moment will be the past soon. We read, and I love this passage. If so, when uh, the man of God, it is in Psalm 130. I don't have it here, but uh, you may have it in the Bible. So let's go Psalm 130. And we'll close on this. Psalm 130, verse 5. Psalm 130, verse 5, you read, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. I like this repetition. When I was a student, uh, I had to work uh, during the evening and during the weekends uh, to pay my, uh, my tuition fees and so on. And uh, so one of the jobs I was doing is a security agent. So I was a security agent in a, in, in a hotel. And uh, I was working in the night and 12 hours night shift. And as I was uh, going to this night, you have to stand before the doors. And after a few hours, I can tell you, your legs are just uh, very, very painful. And what happens is that uh, you look at your watch and you say, oh man, when is the morning coming? And when the morning comes, you are so joyful. When, you, when it gets closer, usually I finish, I go from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. at that time. So when it was about 5, the morning is coming. There is a joy. Because soon, I'm going to rest. I'm going into the rest. And I'm going to find my bed for a few hours. You know what he's saying here? This is what is happening in this Psalm 130 verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my whole being, not some part of me, my whole being. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than the watchman. I was a watchman at that time for that hotel. Wait for the morning. More than the white man, wait for the morning. Brothers and sisters, we have the great news. We have the hope of salvation. We know morning is coming. Whatever is the situation you are going through, whatever is the calamity, if you are truly in Christ, there is this hope of glory in you. You know right now it is the night, but morning is coming and there is assurance about that. This is the hope of the Christian. Whatever you are going through right now, I am telling you from the Lord Jesus in this word that the watchman is waiting for the morning to come. And certainly morning will follow the night. With these brothers and sisters, I hope that we will be, all of us in this church, a family of Christians who are aware of the true Christian hope that is bringing joy into our life. But we should never fall into that false hope because that would bring a lot of depression in our Christian life. 
we will pray for the wrong thing while as we go to the Holy Spirit humbly, not claiming anything because we cannot claim anything. You can even not claim the salvation of your children. You know that? God is sovereign. Only Him saves who He wants to save. We don't claim when we go to God. We come humbly and we surrender our situation, asking Him, what should I do in that situation? Should I go for this or not? And as we do this, the Holy Spirit will come and reveal what is in our heart with some groanings, reveal the plan of God. And that will bring us peace and patience for the will of God to be done. With this, let the Lord bless you and I leave the pulpit to my brother Ben to uh, take over with uh, the Lord's Supper. And uh, as uh, Ben takes over, please continue to meditate on those words because it is one of the most beautiful ground for the assurance of your salvation, my salvation, the hope of the glory to God. Amen.